thank you all uh, for coming today. It's uh, a pleasure to welcome you, to welcome our guest speaker, Greg Gauss. Professor Greg Gauss, University of Vermont, currently chair of the political science department there. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brooklyn's Doha Center. His most recent book, among many, is The International Relations of the Persian Gulf. He was previously on the faculty of Columbia, was a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, Wake Foundation visiting professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and a Fulbright at American University of Wake. He's a PhD at Harvard University. He's going to speak to us today on the GCC Union. The prospect for GCC Union, Greg, it's, it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you for coming. Thanks very much for the invitation, Andrew, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes, which is about eight minutes more than the idea of the Gulf Union deserves. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it's the personal initiative of the, of the King of Saudi Arabia, very much a personal initiative. It was not staffed through. It was not prepared through the normal bureaucratic channels. In this, it was much like the invitation that the King extended to Morocco and to Jordan previously to join the Gulf Cooperation Council. And I think that both of these initiatives, the, the invitation to the, to the non-Gulf monarchs and the, and the Gulf Union proposal, both reflect the King's own personal view of the crisis that the Middle East uh, is going through uh, that we shorthandedly call the Arab Spring. I think that the King views it very, very much, the King of Saudi Arabia very, very much views this crisis as a combined crisis of domestic politics, and what he sees as Iran's effort to dominate the Arab world. Uh, he sees these two as inseparable. And that's why Bahrain is kind of the perfect double whammy for the Saudis. Right? You, both, you get both a domestic crisis in Bahrain, which the Saudis very firmly believe, although obviously one can have different views of the causes of this. But the Saudis very firmly believe is, uh, is directed from Iran and basically, uh, basically the, the Bahraini situation uh, the Bahraini domestic situation became inflamed at the behest of Iran. Uh, one can argue these, these points, but I'm trying to represent what I think the Saudi view of it is. So the King's personal view is that this, these crises are relate, not only related, that they are part of the same crisis. Uh, and thus Saudi Arabia's policy towards Syria, Saudi Arabia's policy toward Bahrain, Saudi Arabia's policy toward Yemen, I think all need to be seen in light of the king's belief that uh, he is the last dam against the spread of Iranian influence in the Arab world. Throw Lebanon in there, throw the Palestinian issue in there. I think that that's the way that it's been. Now, not everyone else in the Gulf views this situation with the same severity or through the exact same lens as the king did. Only, and at the government level, only Bahrain supported the idea of, of a, a Gulf Union, a federal union of the GCC states. Uh, none of the other governments are particular, expressed any particular interest in this. And, and the, the minister responsible for foreign affairs in Oman has publicly said that the, even the committees that were supposedly set up to do the staff work on this are not working. So I, I think that this is a non-start. Very much like the invitation to Morocco and Jordan, basically turned into non-starters as well. Uh, but I do think that that the proposal tells us something about the nature of the Gulf Cooperation Council and threat perceptions in it. And I want to speak for the for my remaining ten minutes on that. It seems to me that that uh, the governments of the Gulf Cooperation Council come together and cooperate in a much more fluid and, and uh, problem-less way when they share a belief that they are in a very high threat environment. In that case, they submerge their differences of views on things. They submerge the sensitivities that the smaller states have to maintaining their sovereignty against uh, you know, the dominant uh, uh, power of Saudi Arabia on the peninsula. They submerge those concerns and work together. Thus, we saw in the Arab Spring, which was a very, very serious threat to, uh, to the regional status quo, obviously, 
We saw Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which, you know, had been kind of at each other for a number of years. We saw them submerge right, those rivalries and differences and basically end up on the same page, for the most part, in the, in the crises of the Arab Spring, whether it be Libya, Yemen, Syria, places where, particularly in Libya, where there might have been some tensions before. Qatar and Saudi Arabia have ended up on the same page. Uh, I think that, that we can see this in past instances of high threat after the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990, and at other times, including the formation of the GCC after the Iranian Revolution and the beginning of the Iran-Iraq War. When the perception of threat is low, when there's a sense, especially in the smaller states, that, uh, that they aren't immediately challenged by uh, regional events, then the emphasis on sovereignty uh, reemerges, and it's harder for the Gulf Cooperation Council states to cooperate. And we see differences emerge, whether it be, and, and, and these frequently are, are, are very small differences uh, of, of purely symbolic nature, like the, the dispute between Saudi Arabia and the UAE a couple of years ago about uh, access through the border because the UAE identity cards showed Sheba as part of the UAE instead of Saudi Arabia, all, all these little things that become kind of more, uh, it becomes easier to, to kind of make a stand on those things when you think everything else is going all right. And, and, and I think that, that what the reaction to the, to the proposal for the Gulf Union tells us is that there are differing levels now of threat perception within the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, obviously for the Saudis and for the king personally, Right? The crisis has not passed. He still sees right, serious problems from Iranian influence in the region. Right? He sees the Syrian issue as, as, as a, a, one in a, you know, a one in a million chance to actually roll back Iranian influence in the region. Uh, and he sees the situation in Bahrain as continuing to be a very serious threat to not just uh, Saudi influence, as opposed to Iranian influence in the region, but also to the institution of monarchy. Uh, and of course, that, that, that is shared by the Bahraini leadership. But none of the other national leaderships see the threat as that salient and that high. Uh, and thus, it seems to me that the, the proposal for the Gulf Union might have had more traction had it been made at the very beginning of the Arab Spring. If it had been made at the end of 2010, the beginning of 2011, it might have had a bit more traction. But the fact that it was made uh, you know, a full year in, I think, is, uh, I think it doomed it to uh, not so much failure as, as <coughs> neglect, because the other smaller states, Kuwait, Qatar, the Emirates, and even Oman, didn't see the crisis as being as severe as it had been, and thus were not willing to sacrifice the elements of sovereignty that a federal union would entail. Uh, even in Saudi Arabia, I would argue, uh, there's not the same sense of urgency, or, 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 or other elements of the government don't seem to share the same sense of urgency that the king obviously feels about this crisis. I mean, we know that uh, the promised uh, uh, development fund for Bahrain and, and Oman, that $20 billion fund, 10, 10 billion to Bahrain, 10 to Oman, that was agreed upon in the previous GCC summit, hasn't, hasn't, been has, hasn't been actualized. The money hasn't been transferred to the Bahraini government. That's the kind of thing that could happen you know, in a minute in Saudi Arabia if the decision-making process uh, we're working smoothly. So I, I think that this proposal uh, for a Gulf Union is a hiccup. Uh, I, I don't think that it, uh, it is going anywhere, and I don't think it represents a fundamental shift in the relationship among the six members, six member states. Uh, but it is interesting in terms of what it tells us about their threat perceptions, and they're different. Let me talk very briefly about the, the smaller union proposal. Right? Uh, 
the idea that maybe Bahrain and Saudi Arabia would would would, would be the core of a of a new union. Right? Uh, that that other member states could join down the road if they so chose. Uh, and some people in the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council states uh, say, well, this, this federal union will be somewhat on the model of what we think our monetary union. You know, it might not be all six states at the beginning, maybe it's only three, maybe it's four, but then the other states can join in. Uh, right now, it, it seems that the only uh, active and possible uh, way forward on that is a Bahraini Saudi uh, move towards something something like the more federal union. Uh, this would be incredibly disruptive within Bahraini politics itself. Uh, it is uh, very vocally and publicly opposed by the major Shia opposition in the country. Uh, it has been vocally opposed by Iran, which would see it as a real disruption <coughs> of, the, of the power relations within, within the Gulf. And it seems to me that, that even though there is some enthusiasm for this among uh, some members of the Al Khalifa family, it's the kind of step that would be uh, so provocative and have such potentially negative consequences with very few short-term positive consequences for Saudi Arabia. Because the Saudis, frankly, are, are, are getting what they need in Bahrain right now without unity. Right? They have an enormous amount of influence. They are, uh, they are in full support of the Bahraini government as it deals with this long-term crisis of authority in the country. And thus, it seems to me that even that smaller union of, of Bahrain and Saudi Arabia is most unlikely to be realized. Uh, although, if I had to put a percentage on it, that would have a higher percentage chance of success than the larger federal union. So again, I think that this is a hiccup. Uh, but I think it's also interesting, this, this proposal and the, and the fallout from this proposal, it's very interesting in terms of what it tells us about threat perceptions in the and it seems to me that, that for the other Gulf states, besides Bahrain, other smaller Gulf states, the notion of where they see their big problems is no longer from kind of a massive Arab worldwide wave of popular uprisings, nor is it from an Iranian inspired and led geopolitical challenge. I think that they basically see their challenges as emerging from how are they going to deal with their domestic political realities right? in the wake of an Arab Spring that has, who knows what it will look like down the road, but has, at least in the short term, <clears throat> pointed the regional vectors, if not toward dem democracy, at least toward greater political participation, greater popular participation in politics across the board. Right? This is the issue in Kuwait. This is the issue that the Qataris are attempting to head off by finally announcing a date for their parliamentary elections, or at least a year for their parliamentary elections next year. Uh, and I think that this is the issue that the Omanis face in the, in the wake of the, uh, the economically driven demonstrations of 2011. Uh, and for each of these, union with Saudi Arabia not only wouldn't help the situation, it might make it worse. And thus, it seems to me that, that uh, they don't have any interest in it. Thanks. No, thank you. Greg, uh, thanks for that. Uh, we'll get this going and some sure. questions. Uh, let me ask uh, the first one, if I could. Given the concern about, you mentioned two general areas of threat perception, domestic politics and the threat from Iran, which at the end you said is not the overriding threats, but are threats of uh, perception nonetheless. What does the union mean, or what about the general trends towards GCC defense integration, given the experience of uh, Peninsular Shield, given the concern about what's happening in Bahrain and elsewhere in the region, and given what's going on with Iran? 
Sure. I mean, I think that, that uh, again, this reflects uh, where they see common threat and where their threat perceptions Right? The, the area where uh, GCC cooperation on security issues is the most intense is on, is on domestic security issues. And I think the interior ministers have uh, a lot more uh, uh, institutionalized cooperation than the defense ministries do. Uh, on information sharing, on, on a whole range of issues. Uh, and they cooperate to manage internal security issues. There are slower steps toward military integration, and, and, and many of them pushed by us, by the United States, from the outside. But it does seem to be, and, and I'm no expert on the technologies here, so if anyone is, please update me uh, and tell the rest of us too. Uh, it does seem like there's some movement toward coordination on, a, on, on the radar systems, on the anti-aircraft. I don't know the details, but there does seem to be at least public announcements of movement there. There doesn't seem to be any movement toward uh, you know, interoperability or, or kind of common kind of common set of, of, of weapons procurement policies. Uh, there certainly doesn't seem to be any kind of, of integration of units. I mean, Peninsula Shield was a dream. Uh, it was always a, uh, it was a, uh, it was always a dream. I think uh, not Peninsula Shield, but uh, the, uh, the the common. Uh, Military contingent used to be up at Hofer uh, I think it was I think they call it Peninsula Shield, right? Uh, that was that was uh, that was always a dream. You know, when when an actual war happened in 1990, uh, the the units in that in, in, that were up at Hofer Alpatan just went back to their national units. They didn't they didn't fight together as a as a coordinated whole. Uh, and after the 90, after the, the liberation of Kuwait, the Sultan of Oman actually put forward a plan for an integrated GCC army. Nothing happened. So I do think that, that on the air defense, there does seem to be some movement. But, but when you talk about cooperation at the, at the level of ground forces uh, and military strategy, that, that's a core sovereignty issue. And, and these states don't want to give that up. The smaller states don't want to give that up. Okay. okay. There's somebody who knows something about this. <laughs> if you could take this just a step further, because if you look at their the price of oil, uh, nobody knows what the price of oil will be two or three years down the pipe, but there are projections. And if you look at the demographics and there are projections for that, at some point in the not too distant future, it, they're going to have to make choices between guns or butter, so to speak. Uh, how do you see that playing out? Is that internal threat going to be perceived as more, uh, more difficult or more important than the external one? Obviously, what happens with Iran will, will make a difference. Right now, the talks don't seem to be going particularly well. So, anyway, I'd yeah. be interested in your. Yeah, I, I think that this has been accelerated by the, the policy reactions to the Arab Spring, which in the Gulf were, were largely to increase the material benefits to the citizens, right? Saudi Arabia famously committed to spend over $130 billion. Uh, some of that is one-off stuff, but a lot of it is recurring expenses with the increase in salaries, the increase in inflation adjustments with an unemployment benefit, all those kinds of things. And, and similar things have happened in the other states. So the break-even point for, for balancing your budget, the break-even point of the oil price has gone up. Now, how much, we don't know, right? Uh, Jedwa, which is, a, I think, a very good uh, local investment bank in Riyadh, estimates that uh, it's somewhere in the, in the low 70s per barrel. So the Saudis are still in, in, uh, in good shape by that. Other people have estimated it for Saudi Arabia as higher. This is not an immediate issue, as oil is still $90 a barrel, and these guys have lots of money in the bank. Right? And we know from the past that when faced with fiscal uh, crisis, uh, all of these states have just spent down their reserves rather than make serious cuts in their, in their spending. Uh, and I think that, 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 so they wouldn't have to make the kinds of choices you were talking about. That was certainly the experience of the 80s and even into the 90s. Uh, but I do think that, that it, it's, 
to some extent, Bahrain is the is the is the canary in the coal mine here. That in that it was uh, it's the first non-oil state in the Gulf. Uh, its budget is still mostly from oil sales, but those oil sales come from Saudi Arabia. You know, the soft. Uh, so Bahrain has had, Bahrain, it's not that Bahrain is not an oil state, it's that Bahrain didn't have those huge reserves of money that the other oil states in the Gulf had to spend when the Arab world started blowing up. And I think that's the major reason why Bahrain blew, and no other Gulf state really blew Oman, blew a little, right? Uh, <coughs> The, the history of these places are that these leaders don't want to make those choices. And they don't want to impose costs on their citizenry. And my guess is that they will take every step that they can to avoid making those hard choices. Uh, and they will try to continue to have guns and butter uh, as, long, as long as they possibly can. I mean, there's some frightening reports. One can, I, I, I'll give them another plug. Jedwood did a fascinating report on kind of a, a 25 to 30 year analysis of the Saudi fiscal situation. And they estimated that at the end of it, the Saudis will need oil to be over $200 a barrel if they're gonna meet their expenses. Why? Because they're, they're using more and more of their own oil domestically, right? To, to, to provide power for an increasingly sophisticated and consumerist uh, economy. Uh, and, and providing that oil, of course, at, a, at, a, at an enormously subsidized rate. So there's absolutely no incentive not to use it. Right? When I was a student in Cairo, one of, the, one of the pictures that always sticks with me, and I always use in my classes, and as, as many of you know, uh, gasoline was highly subsidized in Egypt as well. Uh, and this is in the early 80s. I was walking, when, when oil prices were incredibly high by historic standards. I was walking down the street to, to go to the university, and I saw a cab driver filling up his, his tank. Kusralaini, if you know, if you know Carl. Uh, and, and of course he has a cigarette in his mouth, so I'm moving away from him as, 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 fast, as, as fast as I can. But uh, at the end of which he fills up his tank and then proceeds to wash the back of the car with the gasoline, right? Because gasoline is so cheap that you might as well wash your car with it rather than use water. Uh, and, and, and this is, uh, unfortunately, the, the price structures in the Gulf encourage these kinds of although I haven't seen anybody washing their car with gasoline in the Gulf, thank heavens. Uh, the price structures of, of energy in the Gulf encourage this kind of behavior. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, very interesting. Uh, great. I would, you, you focused on the, uh, the GCC, but I want to enlarge this a little bit to include my favorite country, Iraq, and also now Syria. I thought you were going to talk where, about Sri Lanka, your favorite country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where, where I don't think the so-called Arab Spring is finished yet. Yeah. And the implications for the for the Gulf and particularly Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. I just came back from an interesting meeting, which I mentioned on the way um, up, in which a very good um, Gulf expert who's sitting in Jeddah, I'm mean, not supposed to mention it yet, so I won't, um, made exactly the point that you are with respect to Saudi Arabia and Iraq, you know, the you with your hands off and the, the Mubarak port and so on. And what he said was that this was something personal with, or you know, practically personal with Abdullah, and then no one else in the Gulf, whoever that is, you know, shared that. Uh, so this is kind of striking. So on this whole issue of domestic, the domestic situation as well, Buggy and I, I wonder if you could elaborate um, a, a little on a couple of things. The extent to which there are domestic fault lines within the, the um, uh, decision-making groups, that particularly Saudi Arabia, we can, we can use Bahrain on these, these various issues because uh, they may be facing, let's say, elite splits or something like that on how to handle domestic and, and uh, along with it, um, the extent to which the Shia factor, uh, that is to say sectarianism, uh, as a method of mobilizing support population or the converse, um, uh, you know, real challenges spills over into this Iranian controversy. You've been kind of, um, not, I'm going to say hard over, but leaning pretty much on Iran as a geostrategic 
threat, which is, I think, you know, obvious and very interesting. But could you say a word on how that plays into potential um, sectarian spill, especially from Syria, you know, obviously Iraq, Bahrain, Eastern Shrubbins, sure. as part of this threat perception? I think Saudis in general, and the king in particular, see Iran not just as a geostrategic threat, but as a domestic threat because they see them leveraging the domestic politics of a number of, of regional states, uh, mostly, most commonly through Shia minorities, or Shia majorities, uh, through the Shia community in those states. And it's not just Bahrain, right? It's not just Iraq, they see it in Lebanon, that's the way they view Yemen, even though I think it's enormously exaggerated. And, and also this is the way they view uh, Palestine, uh, at least one aspect of the Palestinian issue, even though it's not a Sunni Shia thing, I mean, the, 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 the division between the PA and Hamas is also a division in the Saudi mind between the guys we back, the PA, and the guys the Iranians back, Hamas. Uh, and, and the Saudis, right, up to the Arab Spring, the Saudis had lost every single uh, place where they tried to confront the Iranians. They lost in Iraq. I think this is their perception. They lost in Iraq. They lost in Lebanon. Right? They lost in Palestine. Right? They tried to, the king tried to bring Hamas and Fatah together. Right? Within six months, it had blown up. And, and Hamas had taken over. Uh, now we can talk about you know, whether the Saudis are right to view it this way empirically, but I think that's the way they view it. I think one of the reasons that they reacted as strongly as they did to the Houthis in, in uh, northern Yemen back in 09-10, in, uh, right? the end of 09 and beginning of 10, was because they wanted to, for regional purposes, to say, hey, we're gonna win, we're gonna win one. I think they exaggerated the Iranian role in Yemen in order to say, well, here's one place where Saudi Arabia's gonna win and Iran's gonna lose. Uh, and thus, when the Arab Spring hit, I think that their view of the Arab Spring from Suez over, right? In North Africa, it's a different story because you know, it's not, there's not that kind of competition with Iran in North Africa. So, you know, Libya, that's just personal. I mean, Gaddafi has insulted the, the king and tried to kill him, and so, you know, who's gonna be against getting rid of Gaddafi, right? Uh, Egypt, was, Egypt was a blow to the Saudis, but I don't think that they see it as, as a win for Iran. But when Syria blew, right, when Bahrain blew, this was not just a threat that Iran was going to, you know, win another, it was also a threat to the institution of monarchy, so it's both a geostrategic and a domestic political. Right? And then when Syria blew, it was a chance to get to give one back to the Iranians, right? It was a chance to win one. It was a chance to take a country out of the Iranian column and put it in the Saudi column. Now the Saudis were, 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 were very cautious about this at the beginning, right? You know, the, 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 the uprising in Syria began February, March, and it really wasn't until Ramadan of last year that you saw the Saudis get kind of really committed to regime change in, in Syria. Uh, but now I think they are. I think that they're all in for regime change in Syria. Uh, is this viewed through a sectarian lens uh, by the Saudis? I think at the very top level, no. I think they view it, frankly, as a balance of power game. But because that balance of power contest is played out in the domestic politics of weak Arab states, where divisions are sectarian, the Saudis will play their sectarian cards. Uh, in the end, they think that they win. Right? I think that that's a, I think that's a mistake. Right? Uh, we can talk about that in a minute. But but they will use sectarianism, right, uh, in order to block Iranian power, and and we're seeing it in spades in in Syria, and we we saw it in Bahrain. Right? The Saudis. Uh, and the Saudi media did quite a bit to try to pose the Bahraini issue in a sectarian light. I mean, when Bahrain started, I, I don't think it was a sectarian uprising. You had plenty of people in, in the roundabout who were Sunnis. And you had political groups, you know, small, elite, right, like Wad, that, that, that were non-sectarian and had plenty of Sunnis in them. Right? But within a month, right, Bahrain had become a Sunni Shia fight. And Syria, right? Maybe there are Alawis who are opposed to the regime. Certainly, there are some Sunnis who, who who are with the regime. But 
but very quickly Syria became a sectarian fight, I think because of, of the nature of the regime there and the, and the networks that it has used to go. So this sectarianism issue, I think, is uh, horrible for American interests in the region, right, for two reasons. One, it pushes Arab Shia toward Iran. Right? It, it, it makes it hard to, have, to, to, to be an Arab Shia activist or an Arab Shia political group and not look to Iran for support, right? If, if the major Arab state with all the money and the influence, the one kind of Arab actor these days, Saudi Arabia, uh, won't deal with you because you're not Sunni, then that pushes you toward Iran. And I, I think we're seeing, we see this in, in Iraq. Now the Saudis would say, no, look, we tried to deal with these guys in Iraq. They made their choices. They're the ones who defined it this way, not us. But, uh, you know, this is, the, this is the situation as we have. I think the second thing that's really bad for the United States in, in this sectarianization of politics in the Eastern Arab world is, uh, is that it provides a, a, a breeding ground for, uh, for radicalism. I mean, this is the kind of environment in which Al Qaeda type ideas, I think, can, can uh, find a second lease on them. I think Al Qaeda was headed for the trash heap of history. Uh, in 2010, right? Uh, and, and I still think it is. But you know, sectarian wars that uh, decimate state power and thus open up air, kind of areas that one can, that, that groups can use to mobilize and, 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 provide, and provide bases, plus the the poisoned atmosphere of sectarianism, combined to give to give you know radical Salafi jihadist groups. A new lease on life, and so, and I think that that's dangerous too. But the Saudis have made their choice, and not not everyone in Saudi Arabia agrees with this. Uh, even even within the even within decision making circles, I think, or uh, that's not fair. Even even within you know kind of elite opinion circles, uh, you know, there's an all there was an alternative way for the Saudis to frame this, which is Arabism, right? We've got these Iranians, but we're Arabs. And at the beginning, if you look back in 07, 08, when the king really started kind of focusing against Iran, and, and you know, I, I would make the case that for a couple of years he tried outreach, he had Ahmadinejad in Riyadh, he, he was trying to feel out whether they could deal with each other. At some point in 07 he said, no, I can't deal with these guys. I can't deal with these Iranians. If you had phrased that split in terms of Arabs versus Persians, it would have been more inclusive, right, in the Arab world. And, less, and perhaps less divisive, but that's not the way it was played. Steve Yeah. Um, by the king proposing the Arab Union and it failing so utterly, uh, what does that say about him? I mean, is he just overconfident, out of touch, feels that he could simply instruct the other members to join up? I mean, there's a cost for proposing something that I think he just thought it was a good idea. Uh, I, I think he feels his years. He knows he's not, doesn't have that much longer to affect policy. I don't know. I don't know the king. I'm, I'm reading in here. You know, you know I don't chat. Uh, but I, I just get the real impression that, that nowadays he thinks if he has a good idea, he has to put it out there. Uh, you know, once is a once can be a, a, a you know a fluke, but twice you know we've got we've got this twice now, two GCC summits, two kind of off the cuff proposals that you know by GCC standards were quite radical, right? Let's expand the membership by two, right? By twenty five by by, uh, by 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 thirty three percent, right? And then let's form a, a federal union. They're very radical proposals by by the the kind of slow moving diplomatic standards of the Gulf Cooperation. And uh, I, I think he just thinks that you know, if he's going to get anything done, he's got to he's got to push things out there. But you know, uh, we see the resistance. Is there a cost in your mind out there uh, for him, leadership, uh, what kind of takes place over the next few months in the Gulf? I, I don't think so because I think that that on core issues like. A common perception that, that Iranian influence is on the rise in the region and that's a threat to everybody in the Gulf. 
on the issue that uh, you know, Syria is a test case for redrawing power relations in the Middle East, uh, and that and that we all got to got to get behind the uh, regime change in Syria. On those issues, I don't think that there's that much difference. Uh, the only players who are really playing a big foreign policy role, obviously, are, are Qatar and the UAE, besides Saudi. Kuwait has is, is got a, a, another iteration of its fascinating domestic political stalemate working. And, and uh, Bahrain has more than enough problems so, and Oman is also, I think, uh, basically focused on domestic issues in the wake of the events of 2011. Uh, so it's just the Qataris and the Emiratis and the Saudis that are that are playing on this larger field of the Arab world, and and they seem to be pretty much on the same page. So in that sense, it doesn't seem to me that there's a big cost to to this. But uh, you know, there. I guess it's not cost less. I uh, caught up in a project on Middle East democracy. Uh, it was about like five or six weeks ago. It seemed like this this union between the, just partic in particular Bahrain and Saudi was kind of a foregone conclusion that we were wait all waiting on the announcement on on that Monday, and then it, it kind of fizzled. And I, I wondered if you had any insight on on what did they just kind of come to to the conclusion that it wasn't worth it? That it, maybe it was not something or wasn't the right time? Do you have any insight? On, on I don't that? have any insight on the particulars of what derailed it. Yeah. You know, I. I I never thought that it was going to happen anyway. So for me, the 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 kind of rumor mill lead up was, I thought, a bit overblown. Uh, look, the Al Khalifa are a very big family, and they ha and they contain within themselves, as we know, numerous uh, orientations toward politics, uh, and it seems to me that. You know, to, to do anything dramatic requires a consensus. Now that hamstrung the king and the crown prince when this crisis started. They could do nothing dramatic to try to avert it or co-opt it or divide the opposition. But by the same token, the, the, the folks in the family who are, you know, for want of a better term, more hard line and who might be uh, uh, happy with a, a, some kind of federal union with Saudi Arabia also need to get a consensus in the family. And my guess is that that is not possible to do. Because in the end, right, you would rather rule an independent country than be you know, the hereditary governors of a province. Right? In the end, hereditary governors of provinces eventually lose their jobs. Uh, but well, so sometimes the rulers of countries, but it's harder, right? Greg, you had mentioned uh, earlier when we were talking about uh, what's happening in Kuwait is what we might see in the future in the Gulf. Do you want to talk a little about that? Yeah, I think that, that uh, you know, if, if we take the Arab Spring and, and we assume that, and this is an assumption, might not be right, but if we assume that one of the enduring legacies of the events of the past 16 months is going to be that it'll just be harder and harder to run a stable government without some democratic element in it. I'm not talking about complete democracy, but without some democratic element in it. Right? Uh, then that has down the road consequences for the Gulf states. And we see this, right? The Qataris say, okay, we're finally going to have an elected parliament. The, the UAE expands the franchise. The, the, the Sultan uh, expands the powers of the parliament and the franchise, right? So it looks like everybody in the region, and the Kuwaitis, you know, finally fire Sheikh Nasser Muhammad and have a new election, and now the courts, you well, know, you can get into court later. But uh, that's, and, and in Saudi, the petitions, once again, calling for elected Mejlis Ashura. And the interesting thing about the petitions this time is that some very prominent Salafi figures signed and this whole this whole thing about you know Salafi Salafi Democrats, right? Or at least Salafi political parties, I think is going to have again if this trajectory continues, it's going to have a profound influence in Saudi Arabia because the Saudis have always said, 
I mean, democracy might be fine for other people, but you know, we have the real Islam. And we don't need democracy in the real Islam. Right? Democracy is an innovation, it's Western, it's Bidah, we don't, we don't need it. Fine for other people, but we don't need it. But when you get right, real Salafis, right, like the Noor party in Egypt, participating in electoral politics and seeming to be fine with it, then the whole argument that democracy is, is against God, right, because it, it denies the sovereignty of God, the whole principle of Hakamiya, right? Uh, when you get real splits in the Salafi community on this, this is going to seep back into Saudi Arabia. There's no question about that, right? And, and this, all, this all might come a proper, right? Egyptian, the Egyptian democratic experiment might fall in on itself, Syria might just be a complete disaster, but, but if there are elections in Syria, my guess is Salafis are gonna participate, and you know, they'll do okay. Maybe not as well as Egypt, but they'll do okay. Uh, if we see that happen, right, then at some point, you know, the Saudis are gonna have to face the fact that the only people in the Muslim world who argue that democracy or some democratic element to government are, are, are you know, kind of contrary to Islam will be, Right, the proponents of Belayat al faqih their own official clergy, and Al-Qaeda. And that just doesn't seem to be a winning coalition down, down the road. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I think that we're seeing this in all of the Gulf states. Now, here's the problem. The problem is Kuwait. Right? If you have an elected parliament, right, that elected parliament can be just fine going along for years and years and years, not having much power. Because folks are just happy, oh, we have elections and we can have a little bit of power. But eventually, elected parliaments are going to want to have power over the government. They're going to want to have a government responsible to parliament. And this is the, this is the key to the Kuwaiti crisis. Right? The, the, the parliament, the recently dismissed, the recently suspended, not, 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 the recently dissolved constitution, the, the parliament was dissolved by the Constitutional Court in Kuwait. Right? The recently dissolved parliament said, we want a majority of the seats in the government. We want parliamentarians to have eight of the seats in the government. Now, this is, this is unprecedented in Kuwait, right? Kuwait, you have usually just one parliament member in the government. That's constitutional. It has to be. He's, Kuwait is called the Muhalli. He's the, he was the guy who made the part, who made the government halal. I love that. I, I, I love that term. He made, he made the government halal. Right? So he was the muhallid. Uh, uh, and you, but you just had one, and the government was not responsible to the parliament. The government was responsible to the emir. The emir appointed the government, and the government was responsible to him. Now, I had to deal with parliament on legislation and all that, but now, the demand in Kuwait is for, I think, a profound change to make the government responsible to parliament. Now, kings in some systems can make compromises along these lines, like in Morocco, because there the king rules individually, or even in Jordan, right, where firing the prime minister is what the king does. But in these family monarchies, right, if the emir or the sultan or the king agrees to have a government responsible to parliament, then uh, the other members of his family lose their jobs. Right? Because parliament is going to want to fill those positions as minister of defense, minister of the interior, minister of oil, that are now filled by members of the family. You know, I, I think that if the king of Bahrain could have fired his prime minister at the beginning of the protests in February of 2011, Bahraini politics might have taken a very different turn, even if he had replaced him with another member of the family. But he either wouldn't or couldn't. And I think that this is the conundrum that these family monarchies will face with parliaments. So I, I kind of don't see an alternative to an increased role for an elected body in all of these countries. And then by the same token, I don't see an alternative to this kind of political standoff, eventually, 
that we're seeing right now in Kuwait. Yeah. Craig, could you comment, please, about the passing of Nayef and the elevation of Salman and what you think this means in terms of PCC politics, uh, domestic politics generally? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't see much of a foreign policy uh, implication to it. I mean, I think, I think Prince Salman represents continuity within the family, within Saudi policy. He's been in the, in the inner circle of decision making for some time. It, it, it's not. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not something different. Right? Uh, I'm. I'm very leery to talk much about what happens inside the family because we don't know. We yes. just don't know. We don't know. You know. Uh, those who know about what happened. No, those who know about what goes on inside the al Saud family uh, don't talk about it. Those who talk about it don't know about it. And I'll prove I don't know about it by talking about it. Okay. Uh, but it seems to me that, that succession uh, issues right now are irrelevant in the short term. They're irrelevant. Uh, no matter who comes in in this generation, and whether Salman uh, it, becomes king, which I think he probably will, whether his crown prince is Prince Ahmed, Prince Satam, Prince Mukrin. If it's from that generation of the sons of the founding king, you're not going to see much change in the way the country is run, in the way its foreign policy is conducted. Right? Uh, and, and thus the, the constant kind of gossip-driven whirl about who's up, who's down, uh, who's pro-American, who's anti-American, it, to me, is is us imposing uh, kind of binary categories on a, 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 a situation that is incredibly fluid and that we don't understand. What we can say as outsiders structurally is that the, that, that the succession issue will become enormously important when you have to go to the next generation because that's one of those you know, key decision moments those of you who are social scientists might know the term path dependency, right? That's, that's, this is one of those moments at which a path will be set, in which one or two or three people and lines will be privileged and many others will be cut out. And that could be a very dangerous situation, but it's not going to happen next year or the year after. <laughs> and, and, and how they also deal with that generational change is something they're going to hold very close to their chest. And, and uh, they're not going to share it with me, that's for sure. Yes, uh, I'm wondering in Turkey, um, as a player in there, what the, the Saudi threat perceptions um, as Turkey plays into the Syria game, the situation with Qatar, and the other? Right. I mean, I think, you know, Turkey has a little bit of soft power credit in Saudi Arabia. Uh, because uh, Erdogan is popular, not just because of you know how he beat up Perez and how they're how they're confronting the Israelis, but also you know the Turkish soap operas are really popular in Saudi Arabia. Turkey is increasingly a a, a locale where Saudis would like to go vacation. Uh, so it, 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 there's a certain soft power buzz about Turkey in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think I think from the f and, and that helps, right? That helps. Uh, that helps the that that helps the government to kind of overcome some of its historical animosities. I mean, remember, the king is old enough to have heard his father tell stories about fighting against the Ottomans and the people, well, not really the Ottomans, but the al Rashid who the Ottomans back, right? Uh, so it seems to me that, uh, that because Ankara and Riyadh are on the same page in Syria right now, that that they have you know, quite a bit of, of room to cooperate. I don't see anybody arguing against it in Saudi Arabia. It's kind of a natural alliance over Syria. Uh, you know, in the longer term, will this be an axis? Will this be kind of a, 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 a you know, some people who, who see the region completely through sectarian lenses talk about, you know, this being a, kind of a Sunni axis, bring the Egyptians in, keep the Iranians out. I don't, I'm not really buying that. Uh, but 
But right now, with Iran being the Saudis, being seen by Saudi Arabia as a primary threat, with Turkey on the same page on Syria, and Syria being the place where the Saudis think that they can do the, they can win the biggest prize right now, I think relations will be will be very will be very positive. And then you know, and the soft power buzz just helps to underline underline it. Hey, thanks so much. I'm Wei Ming from the Singapore Embassy. This is a question returning back to the GCC Union. So what do you think is the way forward in that sense? Um, is, is there a possibility of a soft union? I mean, it's not with impinging on sovereignty issues, but something soft, maybe more economic side. I mean, what the possibility is, is it possible that King, King Abdullah will step away from this idea altogether? You know, I, I, I think that uh, there will probably at the next summit be a report issued that will call for more consultations. And that will be the face saving way through. On the, on the more practical level, uh, you know, there actually was a real proposal up for monetary. Uh, and and in, in the bureaucratic logic of the GCC, that's the thing that where the wheels are just moving, you know, they're grinding forward. And, and that's being prepared, you know, the staff work is being done and it's being prepared. Right now you don't have a political consensus on it. But if you were to get a political census on it, consensus on that, that could move very quickly. You know, the, the opposite is true of, the, of this more grandiose federal thing where there's been no you know, kind of bureaucratic grinding done on it. But the, but the monetary union is, is uh, you know, an issue that, that plenty of preparation has been done. There's just not a political, the political will isn't there yet. I mean, it seems to me that if there's, uh, you know, a practical step forward, you know, it's going to be more on those lines than on any kind of kind of soft federalism or anything like that. Monetary union, you know, is a really serious step, as you know, the Greeks are finding out now, uh, as all all the members of the euro are finding out. Monetary union is a really serious step, but it's not perceived, at least, you know, at, in the first flush, to be as um, Damaging to your sovereignty is, say, you know, more political, <coughs> federal programs. Greg, how would you characterize U.S.-Saudi relations these days? I think they're better than they were a year ago. Uh, I think that the hangover of of the difference of opinion about Egypt has dissipated. Uh, uh, I think that the Saudis want us to do more on Syria, but we're on the same page with them. Uh, we might not be on the same paradigm. Uh, I think that they would like to see us have a, a, a sterner policy toward Iran. They worry about these talks with the Iranians. But, I mean, I think we've got to pursue, we, the United States, we have to pursue our interests as we, as we see them. Uh, well, if the Saudis are, are, are increasingly uncomfortable having us as their own great power. I think that that's been going on since the Iraq War. We're untrustworthy. We, we are a bull in the China shop. We do things that don't take account of their interests. I think that they wished it was a, they wish it was a multipolar world in which they could uh, put some distance between themselves and the United States. But I think that they, the, they realize that there is right now no alternative to a strong security relationship with the United States. There is no other whole, you know, global power of global reach, whatever you want to say, who can provide the kind of security backstop that the United States can. And then you get the generational issue, right? These guys have been, these guys have been comfortable, if not comfortable, they have, they've become used to dealing with the United States for, for decades. You know, really hard to, to to cut that link in any substantive way when you got nothing to replace it with. So it's like a Catholic marriage, you know? I mean, there's no divorce. I mean, it, it, the, the spouses might not like each other that much, and, and, and you know, it's definitely fallen out of love, but it, it's, you know, it, it's kind of, we, we, we got no options, so we might as well make the best of this. I think, I think that that's the way it, it's viewed in. Riyadh, and of course, in some quarters in Saudi Arabia, it's, moved, it's viewed more enthusiastically, and in others, 
less, but I think that that's the kind of lead opinion where the decision makers are. Yes. Um, Senator Governor Bolton, you my question is about uh, the succession issue in Oman. And, um, in, in Oman. In Oman. Yeah. And uh, last year there was a serious uh, standoff between the UAE and Oman, and um, that issue seemed to have somewhat been dissolved. And um, part of part of that tension, to my understanding, was also where um, Oman is going is in Iran, um, as Oman is the only GCC country with a somewhat normal relationship with Iran strategic partnership with the British and even a, a relationship with the Israelis. So with all these kind of balls up in the ear, how do you see, I mean, there's virtually, to my knowledge, no understanding of what Pebble says to cipher or not. Right, right. What's your take guys, on that? Well, there's a couple of letters in a safe somewhere. Right. Uh, it's like a 19th century novel, an 18th century novel. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I think that that contretemps between the UAE and Oman is, a, is an excellent example of, of this idea I put out that when they believe that you know that they're in a low pre threat perception environment, they can play these little games of, of you know, increasing influence or those kinds of things. Because uh, that was all before the Arab Spring broke. I mean, since Arab Spring, I, I, you don't see that kind of thing happen because I think these guys fundamentally know that they hang together where they hang separately, to use the famous phrase from Benjamin Franklin at the, at the, at the Continental Congress. Uh, uh, they know that in, in, a, in a high threat environment, they have to stick together. And so these little games that seem to be being played from the UAE into Oman, as far as I can tell, you know, who knows, as far as we can tell, stopped when things got serious. How, how the Omanis are going to do succession is uh, is one of the great mysteries of the universe. It will be fascinating to see how it works out. Uh, I mean, the, the Sultan is different from every other leader in the Gulf Cooperation Council in that he has not run a family government, right? He's run a personal government. He is the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He is the Minister of Defense. He is the President of the Central Bank. He is the Prime Minister, right? right? You know, my, the, the King of Jordan fires his prime minister whenever there's a crisis. The, the Sultan of Oman cannot fire his prime minister because he is the prime minister. Uh, and then he's filled the government basically, the cabinet basically, with, with commoners, right? With people who are not of the Al Said family. Uh, so what happens next is, is a very interesting question. Uh, and I, I just don't know enough to speculate on it. And I am extremely suspicious of people who do claim they know enough to, to, to speculate on it, unless they're Omanis whose name is Al Said. Then I'm, then I'm <laughs> going to listen to. Well, some people have said that um, um, that uh, Ben Alawi could be a possible. Yusuf Ben Alawi? Yeah. I, well, I was just wondering what you. This is the first I've heard that, but you know, I have. I, I can't. I can't really evaluate. I, I think it would be. It would be amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would be amazing, but uh, perhaps we'd be amazed. Well, Greg, uh, thank you. Sure.